Hey everyone, in this uh, Ride Symbol lesson, what we're gonna discuss is sound and phrasing. First, I wanna break down what I think of makes a good Ride Symbol sound. The key elements for me are a good, clear attack, and then a, basically a smooth, connected decay. And I think of that the way I think of any other instrument that has to play quarter notes. Let's say that they've got quarter notes written and there's no ties and they don't have eighth notes written with a rest in between. They've just got four quarter notes. Every other instrument would re-attack on the downbeat and try to hold that note until it runs into the next note. It would be da, 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 not da, 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 and not Da, 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 where it all runs together. So I think I, for me, I'm trying to make that sound. I'm trying to match that sort of sound. So that's gonna come from uh, a myriad of, of different options. It's gonna come from the symbol itself. It's gonna come from your stick choice. It's gonna come from the tempo. It's gonna come from the room. It's gonna come from the musicians you're playing with, what instruments are they playing with? Are you dealing with amps or no amps? Is it a small room? Are you playing super quiet? All that sort of stuff. All of those things will factor in. Instead of worrying about how all those different things factor in, it's easier to just focus on what you know it's supposed to sound like. So, depending on the room, depending on the symbol, if you know that what you're trying to get out of is a, is a nice, clear, clean attack, and then you want the decay to last long enough so that it connects the notes, and obviously, by the way, tempo would, would matter a lot, then you can adjust your own technique to uh, uh, compensate for that. So first of all, that's why I like having multiple symbols, two or three symbols, because depending on the soloist or the room, or whatever, I can choose a, not only a color, but also a symbol that will match that tempo. Or, you know, so, so if I have a drier symbol on my kit, somewhere up here I know that if I'm playing something super fast and aggressive, I'm probably gonna lean toward that symbol. And I also want something that's got lots of spread in it because when I'm playing a super slow tempo, I'm likely gonna lean toward that. Again, stick choice, where you play on the symbol, how much velocity or snap you throw into the symbol, all those things will change the, the, the sound and the texture, but focus on clear attack and then a kind of a smooth connected decay. So for example, if I played a super slow tempo, this might not be the right sound. That's an extreme example where you hear lots of attack, but there's nothing in between. There's, the decay isn't long enough. I want all that pretty decay to connect to each other. So I may move up and down the cymbal. I also might adjust my velocity. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw the stick a little faster and notice how the, the, the definition, this, the, uh, the clarity of the attack increases, but also in there I can, I can change the spread or the decay of the cymbal. So in that particular instance, I, I started by, by throw, throwing with a lot of snap, and then I decreased my velocity without really adjusting the height. And then after I decreased my velocity, it smoothed out, but the volume dipped a bit. So then I raised my stick height to get more volume without having to uh, speed the stick up any. And basically just from doing that, I can, I can adjust the attack and the decay. So if I were to play something faster, if I were to creep up the cymbal a little bit, notice how the attack will improve and the decay will decline. But if I go down to the bottom of the symbol, here it starts to get washy where the stick definition isn't, isn't as clear. So you can adjust up and down the symbol. 
Uh, also, the size of the symbol matters. If you've got a nice big 24-inch symbol, this is a, a 22, you've got lots of surface area to deal with there. And you can get all these sorts of colors. If it's a smaller symbol, you obviously have a smaller surface area. You have to be more precise with it. But in general, don't bust out the, uh, the, the radar gun to see how fast you're throwing it or bust out the, uh, the ruler to see how, how far you're throwing it. You just use your ears and, and say, and in the middle of, of the set, think to yourself, is my stick definition, can, I, can everyone clearly hear it? Tick, 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 tick. And does it sound like there's a nice even spread underneath it? So when I'm trying out symbols, that's the kind of stuff that's on my mind. How's the stick definition? And up and down the symbol, fast tempos, slow tempos, loud, soft, all that. I, in particular, like really spready symbols. I'm a, I, for me, when I hear Elvin's symbols and they're just all like, for whatever reason, that just does it for me. So most of my symbols are gonna have a lot of spread, which means I have to work harder here to get more velocity so you can still hear that stick definition. You might be way into dry symbols, in which case you have the other issue. Some people um, will use nylon tips on their sticks because that helps them get the, the stick definition because they like really light, really thin symbols. Um, so there's lots of those different combinations, but it's easy to just stay on task. Those two things, nice clear attack, nice connected decay. Now, let's talk about the actual phrasing of the symbols, the notes that you play and when you play them, and how that can drastically affect the feel or the groove. So when I was a, a freshman in college, uh, I, I, was, I was terrible. There was this bass player who, she just loved to like just dig in on the two freshman drummers. Again, right, rightfully so, like we were awful. She'd stare at our ride cymbals and tell us to play in different spots. Yeah, all that was, was a lot to go through. But in all of that, all of the things, you know, the pulling aside and be like, you gotta think like this and stop dragging and don't listen to the saxophone players. In there was this great little nugget of information that, that, that really did change a lot for me. And it's that she said like, you should try to phrase, you should try to make your ride cymbal sound like a bass line. And so she would play the bass and, and she's got little skips in there the way we do on our ride cymbal. For whatever reason, that, that kind of opened up a really simple and clear way to think about how my ride cymbal should be phrased. So I want my right hand to do what a bass player's right hand does, which is, which is really to establish full, fat, strong quarter notes. And then in between there are skips that basically help propel the beat. Because if we just play quarter notes, after a while, it kind of loses momentum. It becomes so expected that the forward momentum that we're expecting to feel in jazz, this pushing forward effect, goes away if, if what you're playing is the same thing over and over again. So I started to take that mindset. And so what I would do is I would practice only playing four steady quarter notes. So I'm gonna play Two different examples, I'll play three different examples. One is gonna be with, with, with the um, one and three kind of getting too much emphasis. Then I'm gonna play the two and four getting too much emphasis. And then I'm gonna play where I'm trying to make all four quarter notes even. I'll do uh, two bars of each. So to me, that really does, can, and also it really helped me lock up with the bass player. Of course, we're both playing quarters, but for whatever reason, I could really kind of work on syncing my right hand's quarter notes with their right hand's quarter notes. So if you focus on even phrasing for all four quarter notes, you will avoid one of the biggest missteps I see, which, which is that when you go to play the full ride cymbal beat, you can lose steam on at the end of each of those that little two beat phrase. So check out how this loses steam and doesn't really stick to our rule of four steady quarter notes. You can hear that as one, two, and three. Four and one, two and three. Now, a lot of that has to do with physics. If you're gonna throw, if you've got a three note pattern here, 
Then after you play that first note, each successive note, if you do nothing about it, will get smaller and smaller. It's like a pendulum. One, you know, basically it never gets back to its original distance. Every swing gets sh shorter and shorter. The same thing happens to your ride cymbal stroke. So if you don't do something about that, if you don't somehow make up that velocity difference, you will get that sound. And that phrasing doesn't line up with your bass player's phrasing. So there's, there's a, a bunch of different ways to do that. All you need to know is that you have to compensate and give a little extra love to that last quarter note. For me, what I do is when I get to that last quarter note, I speed up my fingers and I basically whip the, the, the stick at the end just a little bit. So a slow motion version would be. So I'm allowing a bigger wrist or arm stroke to play the first uh, uh, beat two quarter note and beat four quarter note. Then I allow the skip note or the upbeat to be a little softer and then I have to basically re-energize that last note by using my fingers. And also what that does is now I've spread out the responsibility of getting that, of getting that big sound. It's basically like wrist, finger, wrist, finger, wrist, finger. It's nowhere near this big of a motion, but, but just to kind of exaggerate it. So listen to the difference. So here's, here's the first way. And again, without even worrying too much about the specific techniques of it, just as you're playing, ask yourself, are these quarter notes all even and steady? And a great way to practice that is to go back and forth from playing quarter notes to adding in different combination of upbeats or skips as the bass players think of it. So I'm gonna play just some, some time for a while, I'll comp a little bit, and notice how I'm gonna play a lot of quarter notes and make sure those are all kind of fat and even and driving, and then I'm gonna start dropping in some upbeats and trying to do it in a way that doesn't disrupt the flow of those four steady bass notes, if you will but instead provides momentum or provides some surprise in them. So here we go. So you, I'm constantly trying to make sure that I am not letting up on those four quarter notes. And, the, and even as I start to comp and move around and, and maybe fill or crash the cymbal a little bit, when I, I know immediately I've got to get back to the responsibility of the bass player. And I'm thinking like a bass player. And if the bass player blows, they, they can absolutely get away from that from time to time, but for the most part, they know that's their foundation. And making that connection phrasing-wise to what your right hand does, if you're right-handed, and what the bass player's right hand does, if they're right-handed, all that makes a huge difference in making that connection and making things swing and feel easier for you guys. So think like a bass player when it comes to phrasing. Okay, that'll do it for this one. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about, uh, we've been talking about lots of um, ride cymbal kind of timekeeping stuff. What happens when you go to crash and, and play fills and stuff? The cymbals start reacting in different ways. It can mess up the time, it can mess up the sound and your overall mix of the kit. We're going to get into some ways to fix that. Okay, see you on the next one. Good luck.